Nous allons maintenant débuter les conférences de cette première séance d'ouverture du colloque avec M. Sébastien Voros, professeur adjoint à la Faculté des arts de l'Université de Ljubljana euh, en Slovénie. Il propose une conférence introductive qui nous mènera à la conférence d'ouverture de M. Euh, Michel Bitbol. Donc, euh, j'invite euh, M. Voros à partager son écran. Merci. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, really happy to be here. So, thank you very much, uh, very much for inviting me. Um, I was asked to deliver an introductory, um, uh, an introduction to the key speaker today. So, who will be Michel Bitbol, Bitbol and also to deliver a preliminary talk on uh, an action. Now, before I start, I would like to qualify my talk a little bit, namely, uh, as you can see already from the very title, which was taken from the famous book by Jakob von Uxkull, uh, the, the original translation into English, uh, which was A Stroll Through the Worlds of Animals and Men. So this talk is called A Casual Stroll Through and Around the World of Inaction. Uh, so the talk will be uh, very introductory indeed. So uh, I will briefly delineate the background to an action, so how it developed and its characteristics, implications, its implications. Um, and um, from what I understood when we were talking about this talk is to really kind of lay the foundations to provide a very fundamental account of what an action is. So I sincerely hope that some of the Um, uh, big shots in the inaction community will not this find particularly or too boring, uh, and that it will indeed lay the grounds for the upcoming lectures. So, um, if I start just a second, okay, yeah. So, um, the, the, the notorious little booklet called Communist Manifesto written by Marx and Engels, opens with the famous lines, as you know, probably, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. Now, um, some of the more classically, that is to say, cognitivistically minded uh, people in cognitive science and philosophy of mind might feel the same for uh, what's happening currently in their own respective disciplines. Namely, one could say that there is a revolution e-revolution happening, that a e-revolution is afoot, and that the barbarians and revolutionaries, uh, many of whom, by the way, uh, will also be presenting at this conference, uh, are no longer at the gates, but rather, uh, as it seems, occupying, occupying cafes in the heart of the very city. So what is this infamous e-revolution? Well, it basically consists of uh, a radical reconceptualization or an attempt at a radical reconceptualization of cognition and mind in terms of the so-called four E's. Namely, uh, it's an attempt to construe the mind as embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted. Now, it would seem that new E's are being constantly added to the bunch. So nowadays you can also hear uh, um, uh, the talk about uh, mind being ecological, experiential, emotive, and so on and so forth. And um, every now and again, even a new letter drops in. So sometimes an A is added, so uh, mind as affective. But the, the, the main idea is that um, uh, something was dreadfully wrong with how mind was conceived of uh, before. And this is something that I would like to present today. And of course, I will be focusing on the last part. So the mind as enacted. The provisional itinerary of my talk is as follows. It's fairly simple. So um, At the beginning, I will just briefly delineate the historical conceptual background in which the notion of inaction developed. Then I will focus on the inaction itself, uh, its characteristics, implications, and so on and so forth. And then I will move on to the presentation, a brief presentation of Michel Bitbol, who, uh, among other many things, is an active figure, a tremendously active and important figure in the inactivist movement. Now, uh, since both myself uh, and Michel uh, were mostly influenced by the Varelian tradition uh, in uh, an action, I will address what this means towards the end of the talk. I have uh, mostly, although not solely, structured my talk uh, on uh, around the accounts that are provided in um, the two, I would say, very famous, even 
classical books now, The Embodied Mind from 1991 by um, Varela, Thompson and Roche, and the follow-up book uh, by Evan Thompson, Mind in Life from 2007, I think. Uh, and I've also drawn on um, several um, uh, Francisco Varela's papers from the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, usually an action, as you know, is um, presented in the context of cognitive uh, or mind sciences, as, uh, as they are sometimes called. So these are the sciences which uh, Gardner characterized as um, sciences with a very long past, but a relatively short history. Um, the reason for this characterization is that the topics, themes, debates, and issues that have emerged in the wake, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, in the wake of this uh, inactivist or inactive turn, are actually of um, of a way uh, uh, older date. So one can find these disputes already in the philosophical arena way before, way earlier than that. And um, there were also very lively debates that were very similar to what's happening now, say in the, in the context of cognitive science in the late 19th and the early 20th century um, um, German and uh, um, French um, uh, natural sciences, particularly field, the fields of um, um, psychology and biology. Um, and this is nicely captured by the famous Jerry Fodor's thought, where he says that in intellectual history, everything happens twice, first as philosophy and then as cognitive science. Um, now, cognitive science probably doesn't need an introduction, so just very briefly, it's an attempt to, um, uh, to somehow uh, bring mind and cognition uh, under the purview of natural sciences, that is to say an attempt to naturalize in one way or another, although that's a very tricky term, uh, cognition and mind. Um, it has never become a unified discipline, discipline, although this was the original attempt. So as um, I think uh, uh, Varela, Thompson and so on rightly point out, it's a very diverse um, discipline, so it's more akin to a federation of disciplines than a unified um, uh, science. And there are, of course, several poles of domination. Now, an interesting move or shift happened uh, from um, at around, I would say, 90s, uh, when the, the, um, uh, the, the um, predominant role moved from artificial intelligence to neuroscience. And as we will see later on, this has had a very um, important effect uh, and it is reflected also in the inactive movement. Now, the way this picture or this story, this narrative is presented um, is as follows. And this is a bit of a schematic presentation as all of these presentations necessarily are, but it will do for an introductory presentation. So usually the history of cognitive science is briefly summarized by uh, uh, four consecutive stages, phases, which are not really consecutive, but are closely, inter strongly intertwined. So they're not uh, discrete phases, uh, neatly cut off from one another. At the very beginning, we usually find the cybernetics era, which is characterized normally as a prehistory of cognitive science. So in the Kuhnian sense, this would be a pre-paradigmatic period of cognitive science. So the period where there was no unified paradigm. And um, this period was uh, usually it's depicted as very con conceptually extremely rich, brimming with new ideas, which is actually a nice way of saying that people were just all over the place and they were exploding with various ideas, notions that uh, they wanted to explore. So uh, several paradigmatic alternatives were afloat and um, the early inactive theorists normally tended to gravitate back towards these days and they, uh, they were quite enamored by them, one could say. So they uh, looked upon these early times as times where um, a lot of interesting ideas were uh, present and um, also a lot of missed opportunities. Then um, the, the, the first move, so the first step 
uh, happens um, in around uh, um, 1950s, 1960s, uh, where the, the cognitive science uh, um, gets its first paradigm. So this is the um, famous or infamous cognitivism, of which I will say more later on. Um, this is the first paradigm proper, or I would actually prefer the term used by Ludwig Fleck, unfortunately um, not particularly well-known uh, uh, Polish um, uh, um, um, psycho uh, philosopher of science and microbiologist who uh, use the term thought or cognitive style. So uh, uh, there's a specific way of thinking, specific way of seeing things that gets deeply ingrained in us. Um, and we see certain things from a very, very uh, specific perspective. So we see specific gestalten um, almost as um, self-evident. Uh, and the following two um, moves were basically um, two, two reactions, uh, sorry for this, um, two reactions to the, to the cognitive par cognitivist paradigm, uh, to its two main tenets, namely the idea of uh, symbolic calculation and representation, so the emergence um paradigm if we can call it that is is basically nowadays known by the name of connectionism it's it provides an alternative to symbolic computation and in action then uh tries to get rid of representations that's a very brief um summary um now as i've said the the, the picture is a lot more complicated than that so this is the the image that is provided in several of Francesco Varela's text, where you can see that we have um, nested circles, as he calls them, which are, uh, as mentioned, closely interrelated, uh, and they interpenetrate, so to speak, so that the, the image is not nearly as clear cut as one might, um, one might think uh, if one sees only the, 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 the first presentation in, in uh, three or four consecutive steps. Now, I won't be um, talking about um, the, the, um, the first cybernetics era, uh, but I would warmly, warmly recommend um, um, a fabulous book by Jean-Pierre Dupuis, uh, on the origins of cognitive science, the mechanization of the mind. If anybody's interested in this uh, topic, it covers uh, um, this era extremely well and also brings forth um, different philosophical uh, um, frameworks and, and, uh, and um, horizons that were present and you know, what their implications was, why uh, eventually one got chosen and what would happen if uh, a different path were taken. So let us very briefly take a look at cognitivism. So uh, in the 90s, 1950s and 1960s, uh, during a series of conferences and several publications, um, um, what happened was what Gardner called the unofficial launching of cognitive science. And this is basically uh, um, the cognitivist approach uh, was developed and this cognitive or cognitive uh, or cognitivist revolution is usually depicted as a as a reaction to the then predominant behaviorism uh, with which cognitivism actually shares more than it is usually willing to admit especially especially um, the overall or the broad aim or goal to mechanize the mind and uh, in the way it conceives of the mental states and processes. However, usually uh, the way that this story is presented is that with cognitivism, finally the black box of the mind was opened and the, the scientists and philosophers were no longer forced to just study behavior uh, as that which uh, supposedly um, exhaust the domain of cognition, but could actually start talking about the processes that are actually happening within the mind. Um, and um, the, the, the main idea was here uh, that cognition is information processing, which consists of uh, symbolic computation and representation. I'll say more about these later on. Uh, and the overall approach is uh, encapsulated in uh, a maxim uh, given by uh, Francisco Varela in one of his papers, uh, 
the brain processes in, the brain processes information from the outside world. So a very familiar, very simple notion or idea. Now, um, it is good to try to capture these approaches via their dominant or predominant metaphors, uh, because metaphors um, tend to play a significant, significantly greater role in uh, in science than scientists and philosophers of science are usually willing to admit. Um, namely, they, they um, allow us to capture a unique tone or style uh, of a specific way of thinking that becomes prevalent, that becomes predominant. Um, and this um, is, I think, um, um, it's very telling that it is at this point that the mind was conceived as a digital computer, so as a symbol manipulating machine. And Rosenberg already in, in 1970s called this computer gestalt, which I find really extremely fitting because just as we, when we operate our eyes are presented with gestalten, with these structurations and formations that are simply there and they simply seem self-evident, the same happens one, once one, one, one acquires a specific thought style uh, of which I was um, uh, talking about earlier on. So you start not only thinking about things in a specific way, but actually seeing them. They just become self-evident. And there are just so many examples in the history of science that could be uh, mentioned here. Um, so, yeah, basically the idea is that uh, cognition is information processing. At the beginning, sometimes it was mentioned as a metaphor. Eventually it became uh, actually uh, a, a, a descriptive designation so that uh, cognition is in fact information processing. And in one of the texts, um, Francisco explains this with a slightly strange phrase perhaps, calculation of symbols, but it's actually very fitting. So what does calculation of symbols mean? Symbols are simply items that are uh, that have a physical form. Um, uh, that is to say they're physically, say neurophysiologically instantiated um, and they stand for something. So they re represent something in the world. And then calculation is basically um, various formal syntactic algorithmic operations that are being done on these uh, on these symbols. So in short, cognition is formal or algorithmic manipulation of symbolic representations. That's the main idea. Another somewhat oversimplified scheme is this, so that information processing is characterized by three features, that the that cognition is linear, that is to say it happens in successive steps. It is local, so, so it follows specific localized rules and functions. Um, and um, it is related to representation. So um, at the core of this approach is the uh, idea of mind being the mirror of nature, as Rorty calls this. Um, that is to say, um, um, mind is something that reflects, represents the external predetermined pre-existing world. And this then, uh, in a nutshell, would be what Dennett called um, um, high church of computationalism preaching the gospel of boxology. Why boxology? Because of all these neat, uh, well, structured, well-delineated boxes where you have everything in place, everything in order. Um, this approach is very nicely presented with this image from the tree of knowledge where we have the Caesar who sees an outside object here, an eagle, and then um, once um, um, a symbolic representation in, is formed in his brains, this goes through a series of Form, successive formal um, operations um, and eventually leads to the activation of series of muscular contractions, which makes the Caesar say Aquila, so eagle. Now, the second paradigm, the first reaction to the, the computationalist paradigm is the so-called emergence. Um, and the, the, the main idea here is um, um, a move away from the digital computer and uh, seeking inspiration in the um, biological systems, more specifically in the neuronal system. So here the main metaphor become, 
uh, uh, neural networks. Um, so these are usually artificial networks, virtual systems that run on digital computers. And the more common name for this approach is connectionism, which has, um, of course, several offsprings, so much machine learning and nowadays deep learning and their ongoing debates to what degree these are compatible with an activism and to what degree they salvage certain problems or solve certain problems that were um, um, brought forth against them in these early periods and so on and so forth. So why this reaction? Why, why did this alternative approach emerge? By the way, this alternative approach was actually an approach that was already present during the cybernetics period. So, you know, this is one of the examples why uh, Varela, for instance, found uh, going back to these early days was so fascinating because many of the models or at least conceptual frameworks were present already back then. But one of the one of the reasons is definitely um, um, the, the the wish or desire to introduce introduce more plasticity into cognitive systems. So um, although um, the cognitivist approaches or cognitivist systems and models were very robust. Uh, they were a bit akin to that, you know, almost proverbial boyfriend who is very uh, structured and very uh, organized, but extremely dull and extremely rigid. So uh, it would seem that natural cognitive, uh, cognitive systems uh, were behaving in a significantly more plastic, flexible, dynamic manner and that they were able to compensate for various um, um, localized breakdowns and whatnot. So here cognition becomes related to stable emergent patterns. It is no longer related to symbolic computation. And this is the, 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 the aspect that most fascinated the early um, um, in, in activist thinkers. So this idea that from distributed local processes, you can get an emergence of global, stable global patterns. So uh, very briefly, um, um, what we have here, as I said, is not a digital computer, but a neural network, which is a network of interconnected components um, where you have um, various layers of simple nodes, that is to say simple neural-like um, items or units and these are linked by weighted connections and the connection strength so the strength between the connections between these uh, nodes um, changes according to specific learning rules that are introduced into the network or and by history of the activity so the way that the um, um, that the network itself restructures itself in every uh, cycle. And after a while, the whole network, that is to say, the whole system converges or gravitates towards a particular cognitive performance. I will skip this quote. Um, okay, so instead of linear and local processing, what we get here is something that is more dispersed. So we get parallel and distributed processes and uh, there is a shift towards the system as a whole, so not to specific modules or specific discrete uh, segments in the, the mind that operate, but to the system as a whole. So uh, it's a more, more of a holistic conception, which becomes even more radicalized uh, later on with the introduction of the inactivist approach. And when I'm talking about holistic, this is to be understood without any esoteric or explicitly esoteric under or overtones. So uh, uh -huh. one thing that I forgot to mention on this slide is also that history becomes important. So the history of the system, as I mentioned, uh, becomes relevant. So this the de developmental evolutionary aspect, if you like, uh, is introduced into the story uh, whereby you don't have these predetermined, pre-formed um, functions just being there, lying there, but they are something that develops in a specific context and in answer or, or in response to a specific problem. And um, 
uh, a very neat way of presenting this is that cognition here is no longer akin to a chain of command, but it becomes more similar to a cocktail party conversation where you have several people talking with each other. Um, and, um, but still what you get is an emergent narrative that uh, is fairly stable. Um, okay. Um, something has just shifted. I hope everything is okay. Uh, so um, what is still remains here, however, is representation. So the representations are still in the picture. They still haven't been uh, taken out, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, as usually the inactivist theorists uh, uh, point out, there is still something artificial because the problems are brought to these networks from the in outside, the, the proper solutions are determined from the outside and so on and so forth. So. Um, um, there, there are some interesting uh, points that could be made from a Conguilemian perspective about uh, this being the most teleological um, uh, approach, but yeah, we can maybe address this at some other point. Um, anyway, and now we're finally, we finally arrived to the um, inaction. So um, as I've mentioned, uh, the early inactivist theories were greatly inspired by this uh, uh, emergence or connectivist approach, especially uh, the, the ideas about the dynamic relationship between parts and wholes and the constitution of the emergent wholes. But they, they still felt that something was missing, that the whole picture was insufficient. There was something artificial about it. And the problem was that these um, processes that, so that lead to these emergent global structures uh, just ignore the context in which this happens in living cognizing systems. So there, there is uh, um, not enough emphasis is given on the fact that uh, they occur in the context of or in the horizon of uh, organic or organismal holes that are actively engaged with their environments. So um, um, instead of having predetermined problems with predetermined solutions, what is needed is a way to come to a system which brings forth its own problems and brings about its own solutions, which then of course can become sedimented and become uh, standardized and so on and so forth. But there has to be this creative moment, uh, which seems to be lacking in the previous pictures. So what would be the, the motivation? Um, well, the, the fact that cognitive beings are in fact uh, usually living, that is to say, active, dynamic, processual beings. So uh, beings in which it would seem that action is a constitutive segment of their being and that action is should be considered as constitutive of um, of uh, cognition. Now, before I go into an action, maybe a few brief words on um, 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 just a second. Uh -huh. Okay, I didn't see, sorry for this. Uh, I didn't see that you asked me to slow down. Okay, I'll try to do no, so. It's perfect. It's perfect now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay. Sorry for this. I, I don't see the chat. I just saw the number. Okay. So the influence is very, very brief presentation of the influences. There are several, uh, the, 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 the ones that I um, forefront here are the ones that Francisco Morella, Varela explicitly mentions um, in his text. So the, the cybernetic tradition, which I already mentioned, although it should be um, added that uh, uh, the, the second order cybernetics uh, that was introduced by people like von Furster was uh, of particular importance. Then of course, there's the famous and now well-known phenomenological and hermeneutical contribution of thinkers like uh, such as Husserl, Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger, and even Gadamer, Sartre, and others. Uh, there's also historical epistemology, which curiously usually in these portrayals and depictions usually gets a, a bit of a short shrift, although um, uh, Francisco Varela explicitly mentions that Coiré had a very, very um, uh, profound effect on him, as well as Bachelot and Conguilem. And these are, Conguilem will be one of the authors that I will be using in my, my next lecture in, on Wednesday. And then there's, of course, Buddhist philosophy, particularly the philosophy of the famous um, um, 
originator of the Madhyamaka school, Nagarjuna, and the Tibetan tradition, which is basically founded on Nagarjuna's thought. There are, of course, many others, uh, other influences, some of them explicit, some of them implicit. For instance, the, one can trace the influence of uh, uh, pragmatism, of holistic biology, Wittgenstein, and so on and so forth. But the main issues, so the main point or the main characteristic, the main common thread that one finds uh, running through these various influences is precisely a philosophical problematization of something that seems self-evident. So this, um, uh, these self-evident tru truisms, so to speak, about the nature of uh, a cognizing being and how it fits into the world. Um, um, Yes. Um, okay. So uh, one of the things that is important uh, in relation to an action is that cognition all of a sudden is no longer um, limited to the head or the brain, but becomes related to the organism as a whole. Nay, what is more, to um, organism as it copes with its environment. Um, so cognition here becomes construed, it is usually uh, um, portrayed as embodied action, and this is supposed to stand for inaction. Uh, by the way, as, a, as an interesting side note, um, it should be mentioned that Francisco Varela was never particularly satisfied with this designation. So initially he wanted to call his approach hermeneutical as Evan Thompson, um, pointed out in one of the seminars in the past uh, and he always felt that an action was actually a compromise of sorts and not a particularly good one so uh, but okay let's try to break this down if an action is embodied action what does this mean well embodied the notion of embodied means that it pertains to the living bodies which are understood not as assembly of parts so not as assembly of discrete, separate, uh, isolated, uh, anatomical slash physiological parts, but as autonomous wholes. So um, there is a very pronounced uh, anti-reductionist uh, segment or element to this. Um, and this, of course, goes back to Francisco Varela's early work in uh, the field of autonomous and autopoietic, uh, autopoietic systems, that is to say systems that self-produce, that self-govern, um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody more or less knows about this, but there's this interesting interrelation between parts and wholes where you have uh, parts which are only parts in the setting of the whole and the whole which actualizes or realizes itself only in and through the parts. So the, the processes, for instance, in a cell, metabolic processes uh, um, produce uh, the the the, um, uh, the boundary and this boundary then becomes the condition of the possibility for these metabolic processes to take place in the first place place so there is a certain interesting circular or as uh, Varela sometimes um, um, says a dialectical relationship between parts and wholes which is of interest here and this already brings us to the second aspect namely why action well living bodies are not just autonomous holes, but they are dynamic holes. So uh, for living bodies, uh, uh, action is constitutive of their being. It is, uh, stasis means death for the living beings. And I would like to read a, a short quote here by Brady from, uh, uh, that quote is taken from a lovely paper called Form and Cause in Goethe's Mor Morphology, uh, where Brady says, the forms of life are not finished work, but always forms becoming, and their potency to do otherwise is an immediate aspect of their internal constitution, a necessity to change in order to remain the same. So they, the, the living beings need to change in order to remain the same, so that to, to keep on living. Uh, and the basic idea behind inaction is that living beings, these autonomous wholes, enact both themselves and their milieu. So they in enact themselves as normative centers, um, as centers which determine or at least contribute to how they will respond to specific influences from the outside. But because with every, they, are, um, they, they never 
coalesce with what is given at a specific time. So with, with, with the actuality that they uh, present at a specific time, they are always they are always also beyond themselves. And in this sense, they they kind of project into the 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 surrounding into their uh, into the the milieu as it's called. So um, the living bodies in their ongoing uh, attempt to uh, maintain their internal coherence uh, um, uh, project outside of themselves a milieu or uh, as it is sometimes called umwelt, which is a domain of significance. That is to say, a domain of significant structures for that organism. Uh, of structures which are relevant for that organism to maintain its organization. And uh, perhaps an interesting uh, note here, this means that organisms are never fully centered in themselves. There is always something milieu-like to the organism and always, always something organism-like uh, in the milieu. Um, there is a very famous example of sucrose here where sucrose as a specific uh, molecule um, is um, not pertinent for the organism merely for its chemical because of its chemical structure but it has to do with the specific state in which the organism finds itself so it is not necessarily um, 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 a given entity itself as depicted in a certain physical chemical account that is relevant but a certain relation that becomes established between it and the living organism so cognition, again, embodied action or inaction. And now we've seen that cognition, according to this account, is closely related to living. Uh, in fact, um, there was um, uh, a very strong emphasis on this continuity or a structural similarity uh, in, in the inactivist tradition where there was talk about mind love, life continuity and so on and so forth. And the main point here is that representation is cast aside and instead uh, the notion of sense making or bringing forth a world, bringing forth a milieu or um, a, a meaningful domain uh, becomes uh, more important. So instead of talking about informations coming from the outside, Varela would sometimes talk about organisms informing themselves. That is to say, they uh, constitute uh, normative holes which determine conditions of possibility for their persistence and in this sense they form themselves um, and also determine in what way or at least contribute to what way they will uh, respond to the outside uh, influences. Now moving on to the present time there uh, are a lot of approaches um, in uh, that go by the name of uh, inaction and inactivism nowadays. Some of them are closer to what I've just presented. Some of them have taken some of the ideas that I've presented and put them into a somewhat different setting. So what I here call hermeneutical uh, inactivism in line with what I've just said, uh, what I've said before. Um, uh, so this is the 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 type of an activism um, that um, Thompson, Di Paolo, Frus, and so on and so forth develop. Um, this is still very much in the vein of what I've presented. Sensory motor and activism puts most emphasis on these sensory motor loops and is already in a certain sense um, different because it is not really interested in some of the topics that usually uh, the, the hermeneutical and activism is. And then there's also, I don't know, uh, I would call it, they call themselves radical and activists. I have a bit of an issue with this, that designation. So I just uh, 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 refer the, to them here as um, uh, um, analytic or maybe functionalist uh, and activism presented by Hutu and Mein, and I'm pretty sure that we'll uh, be able to learn a lot about this approach in, in the later uh, presentations, which uh, has basically taken some of the ideas of inactivism, the notion of inaction, and embedded it into the more classical debates in the analytic uh, philosophy of mind. Now, one thing that I would like to mention before I wrap this up and then move on to the short presentation of Michelle, uh, is the thing, so one um, um, thing which I have basically avoided or not, I haven't mentioned till now, but actually plays an extremely important role in, in uh, the inactive tradition, namely, it's the following. Um, 
if living is closely related or even identical to cognition, and if cognition or cognizing is basically an action, this has interesting consequences for the relationship of, say, science or any uh, cognizing agent. So not only do we apply these terms, these notions to the observed phenomena, so the living organisms, so the objects of our inquiry, we observe living organisms that uh, interact or engage with their environments, but also the scientist, him or herself, is a living organism and therefore also, in a certain sense, enacts um, an environment of sorts. Um, so cognition there is also in action, and this opens up a whole can of worms, epistemological, like a, a whole can of uh, epistemological and uh, ontological worms. But the main point here is that all of a sudden lived experience of that particular observer, of that particular cognizer becomes relevant. So cognition does not simply happen somewhere, but it is something that is closely related to the lived experience. So the umwelt of a cognizer, of a human cognizer, is also it, uh, his or her Lebenswelt, so his or her life uh, world. And um, this has led to uh, a renewed renewed, uh, uh, revitalized uh, interest in the study of lived experience, uh, which is why um, the inactive tradition has uh, contributed significantly to um, different um, disciplines that are trying to do this to bring investigation of experience in one way or another um, under the, 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 the umbrella of um, contemporary science. So we have approaches like neurophenomenology, first-person inquiry, such as microphenomenology, uh, contemplative inquiry. So there was this, um, there have been these uh, interesting, although I would argue very problematic attempts to, to establish a fruitful bridge between contemplative traditions, especially Buddhism and science, and so on and so forth. So uh, as we mentioned at the very beginning, we said that uh, an e-revolution is afoot and that this e-revolution is related to the attempt to uh, construe or conceive of uh, cognition and mind as embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted. Now we understand better what this means. So the, um, the mind is embodied, it is enacted, it is, it is extended because it extends beyond the, the limits of the skull and it is embedded in its surrounding, in its environment, in its milieu. How these things are construed is still um, um, debated, but this is the, 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 the gist of the main idea. Okay, now to the last, but definitely not least segment of my talk. Uh, Michel, and I hope that he doesn't mind that I call him by his first name here, um, has been a very a key figure, I would say, in, in the inactivist movement. And uh, not only was he inspired by the inactivist tradition, but has himself contributed greatly to the inactivist tradition uh, and almost on all levels. So he, he published on autopoiesis and autonomous systems, on an action embodiment, on the first person research, and also on the relationship between an action or the introduction of the notion of an action in the context of uh, natural sciences, particularly physics. Uh, and this will be, if I understand, if I understood the, the overview correctly, also the main topic of his talk today. Um, now, very briefly, um, um, a brief, very brief presentation, if I can actually get this to work. So uh, Michel is an emeritus researcher at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in P Paris, France. Uh, he received an MD and PhD in physics and a habilitation in philosophy. After a start in scientific research, he turned to philosophy of science, editing texts by Erving Schrödinger and formulating a neo-Kantian philosophy of quantum mechanics. He then studied the relations between physics and the philosophy of mind in collaboration with Francisco Varela and drew a parallel between Buddhist dependent arising, so the Buddhist notion of dependent, uh, dependent arising or codependent arising and non-supervenient relations with quantum physics. 
He also developed a first person conception of consciousness expressed from the standpoint of an experience of meditation. And more recently, he has been engaged in several other debates, among others, in a debate with the so called speculative realists. Uh, now, Michel has published on many, many different topics, and he has co authored several authored, co-authored, and edited numerous volumes, some of which you can see on this slide. And as mentioned, he has been extremely, um, he has been extremely uh, active participant, not only in the inactivist community, but also in several other uh, uh, domains of research and uh, discussion. But one of the things that I would perhaps like to underscore before I wrap this up is that Michel is also one of those few academics today who not only uh, outstanding scholars, but who also embody or do their best to try to embody and enact what Pierre Ado called philosophy as a way of life. That is to say, um, an attempt to pursue a philosophical life or a life devoted to wisdom and virtue. Now, virtue sounds strange nowadays. It's trying, it sounds extremely anachronistic, but the way I'm using the word here is um, in the old Greek sense of arete, which means excellence. So basically it is a life devoted to the pursuit of excellence in all endeavors, in all domains. Anyway, um, I am actually honored and grateful that I was able to um, do this little introduction to Michelle's talk. I hope that you have found at least something of merit in it. And now, Michelle, the floor luckily is yours.